The Bible tells us, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. It says to receive with meekness the implanted Word, which is able to save your souls, and to be diligent to present yourself approved to God, rightly dividing the Word of Truth. Join us now for the 3 ABN Sabbath School panel. Our study today is the Book of Acts. Happy Sabbath. Glad you could join us. I tell you, this is going to be an exciting, exciting lesson. I, when we study the book of Acts, I just get excited because there's things in there that I, we can really learn as a church. So we're going to be on lesson number four. And again, we're glad you joined with us. And uh, this is 3ABN Sabbath School panel. I know many of you, I, I've heard when I've traveled, people really enjoy the, yes. the panel. So bless your hearts and thank each one of you today for being here with us. We'll introduce you later. I'm Kenny Shelton, and I'm glad today that we're going to be on this, this, number four of the lesson. It's very interesting. We're talking about the, the first church leaders. And to me, it was very interesting because when we looked at this, this is where it kind of began. This is where it was set up. And anytime you begin something and begin to set it up, Holy Spirit is working, the enemy is going to be working, and there's going to be issues. So today I think we're all going to be looking at different issues and we're going to attack those issues and we're going to see how God worked it out through the power of the Holy Spirit. Again, you study the book of Acts, uh, it's electrifying. If you don't mind, I can use that word electrifying. There's things that we study that's good for the church today. Amen. We need it for today. In fact, we study the book of Acts, the first church that was set up is supposed to be that example for us throughout until Jesus comes. So we can learn from these things and it's full of information and so on. It's a story of, you know, God choosing individuals to set this church up and to, to, to get it going and moving forward. But naturally you're going to be dealing with issues. We're going to be dealing with problems. And I think it, it, how do we deal with these issues? How do we deal with these problems that would, would arise? Well, I hope by now uh, most of you have your study guides, and I realize that a lot of people, we have new viewers. I, I'm convinced that there's new viewers all the time, Absolutely. so we have to you know, repeat some of these things, right? And people need these lesson study guides, and I'll tell you how to get them. Simply download these. Just go and download these lessons on absg.adventist.org. Org. And if you do that, you will get these lessons, these are adult Bible study guides. And it's always good. Some of you are getting a little bit lazy because you're not getting these guides and you need to <laughs> bless your hearts. You need to get these guides and follow along. We'll find that you will learn a whole lot more if it's set before Absolutely. you and you study, you're underlining and you're jotting down passage of scripture that each one might say just quickly and say, we don't have time to go over it, but uh, look this up and for your own study. If you happen to be gone, I always say set your DVR, man, record it. Uh, you'll be able to come back and look at it at the main station here. You can look at it on YouTube. Uh, you know, in, in anything that you have, device of your choice, just make sure you're watching it. And we're glad that you are, and then we're glad you joined us. And then we should introduce our panel for today. On my left, Sister Shelley Quinn. Always good to have you. You know, oh, it's, always, it's, it's always good. To, I kind of call it working together. Do, is that what we do here? Amen. Is working, working? Amen. Yeah. You know, one thing I have to say. Yeah. The people love this. We, we know that our audience loves this program, but it's my favorite program because oh, get to sit with my friends and hear, get the benefit of your study as well as mine. Yeah, well, that's, that's that, isn't that wonderful to be able to work together. And who do you have on your left? I have Pastor C.A. Murray, my dear brother. Good to be here. Yeah. Very, very good to be here. I find I study harder for this 10 minutes yeah. than I did when I was teaching my, my classes at, when I was pastoring. I had pastor's class. I put more time in on this than I did in the pastor's class. This, you, you, you tend to put a lot in and there's so much to, to learn from each other. And to my left is Ms. Jill Morricone. It's a privilege to be here and open up God's Word and study together. And I learn and grow from each one of you and what you share of the Word of God. And to my left mm -hmm. is my dear friend and mentor and mom, Molly Steenson. Mm -hmm. And I've got to say that doing these Sabbath school panels has been, it has been for me. I have grown, the depth of my understanding of God's Word has grown, and you're right, that just to do 10 minutes, yes. we put hours of study in a piece. <laughs> I've, I've heard it said several times, well, that must be an easy thing, you know, you go uh -oh. 10 minutes and then, you know, pass it on to somebody else. I said, well, you're supposed to at least pay attention to what the other folks are doing too, so there's a little more to it than that. We learn, it's good, but there is a lot of study, and there is uh, many times, we're talking about hours 
of studying and going through. So, but it's always a blessing, isn't it? it Sister is. Molly, since you were speaking last, would you have prayer for us, please? Would be delighted. Holy Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus. And Lord, we are so grateful that you've given us this blessing, this opportunity yeah. to break the, the bread of life with yes. your people. Thank now, you. Father, we just all bring our hearts before you. Ask, Lord, that you would purify and perfect our hearts, that we would stand before your people with clean hands Amen. and a pure heart. And Father, we yield to you that the words that are spoken here today will be anointed of you. They will go into every listener and every viewer's ear. They will take root in the heart and grow yeah. and prosper and bring us all into closer relationship with Amen. you in Christ's name. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. We're prayed up and ready to stay the lesson. Let's do our Sabbath, all right? Get into the Sabbath. We're just going to be a quick overview of it and time's ticking down rather quickly. We'll just cover what we can and we go right to our memory text. Now in the memory text, I know it's, what is it, it's the new revised standard version and I have a habit of reading out the King James Version. Some people like it, somebody, uh, others don't, but I, I appreciate it. And it says just about the same thing. We can read it together if we'd like here, panel. Are we ready? The, the Word of God, God continued, continued to spread. The, the number of the disciples increased greatly in Jerusalem, Jerusalem. And, and a great number of the priests became obedient to the faith. faith. That's uh, what Acts 6 verse 7. I thought, here's a real problem and I like it. Here's the key. Notice what happens. It says, and the Word of God did what? The Word of God increased. And anytime the Word of God increases, then also the, the, the prospect, the potential of members and the church growing as the what? The Word increases and goes out first. Growth is very, very important is what I looked at in this lesson. Amen. If it's not growing, then it's dying. So the church needs to be active. It needs to be growing. But along with a new church and growth, a lot of times it grows faster than we're able to put things together to take care of the church. I don't mm -hmm. know if you ever had that experience or not, but you have to be able to have things in place to take care of the new members, the different thoughts and the different minds that come, in, uh, that come into the church. And so there's uh, growing pains. In our lesson, there's some growing pains I like to think about, and I'll, I'll name a couple of those. We have, we have some converts, the new converts that's coming in uh, from Pentecost. They were Hellenites. You remember those? Who were they? Greeks. Jews. They, were, they were Jews, weren't they? Jews from the, the, the Grecian or the Greeks and, and then also from the, the Roman world. Mm -hmm. Well, what does that do? All of a sudden, we've got a language problem. It's hard to, it's hard to understand. We're speaking different language. Uh, the, uh, the, the main language was what? Aramaic, wasn't it? So we'll speak there in Judea. So they had problem language and so they, plus they had uh, culture, cultural differences. They had religious difference. They even thought differently. And sometimes when you're in a different country, you think just a little bit differently. So they had all these things kind of working against them while they were trying to work together. And so a lot of these new converts that came in, mm -hmm. think about it, they were just not, they weren't really uh, attached to the, the temple services and ceremonies. They really wasn't all convinced about the Mosaic law and so on. So there was other issues that were springing up here. Nevertheless, God used many of them, didn't he? Many of them to do uh, witness to the world. Sunday's lesson, let's go quickly. I remember studying this as, as a young person about the seven, the seven deacons. And I thought, boy, this is wonderful. But you know, as I studied this lesson, I, I found out, very interesting, that the deacons back then, they would just talk about the seven. The New Testament just re referred to them as the seven. But uh, we call them seven deacons. They did a whole lot more than the deacons do today. So I'm not Absolutely. sure if we don't have the men to do it anymore or not. <laughs> if something is wrong. But they, they had a lot of responsibility as deacons back then. And so if we look at it from the church standpoint, again, I think maybe we all look at it. There was a complaint. What was the complaint? You remember that complaint in Acts chapter 6, verse 1? Uh, it just simply says what well, there was neglect going on. It said in those days when the number of disciples had multiplied, I like this, Acts 6 verse 1, there arose a murmuring among the Grecians. They were against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in daily ministration mm -hmm. or in distribution or uh, uh, bringing relief. So because the language buried, cultures and so on and so forth, uh, some were getting taken care of and others weren't getting taken care of. It, it's a legitimate, I think, complaint. Let's say it nicely. It's legitimate to have a complaint if it's something against the gospel that we need to have taken care of. Some people complain because they just love to complain. <laughs> but if we look in realistically, uh, that's one of the aspects of selfishness is really complaining. Yeah. That's really the, the, probably the, the, the highest phase of that is, is, is selfishness when you look at it. But when there's legitimate source, naturally we, could, we need to bring that out. I call it an alleged neglect 
but it proved to be truth. And it wasn't because the church was growing too fast. There wasn't enough people to take care of all those who needed to be taken care of. Changes need to be made. And as soon as that complaint was made, what happened? Church, you know it. As soon as somebody complains in the church, and again, this is legitimate, something needs to be done, the enemy come in. That's the wedge for the enemy to come in and try to destroy the church, divide, separate, and to conquer through complaints. Suspicion, arousing suspicion. Well, I think maybe they left us out because I'm different or they left us out because of... So suspicion came in. What should the church do? If you have it today, if we have it today, something comes in, there's conflict in the church. What should the church do? Should we just ignore it? Yeah. Or should we really look at that situation quickly and try to handle it before it festers up? Mm -hmm. We need to look at it quickly and try to handle it. Act fast, settle the difference, or there will be division. I've been around long enough. That's the way it works every time. Isn't that right, Pastor? You know that. Each one of you know that's work with it. Here's a solution. We talked about there's issues, and so some weren't getting taken care of. Remember, there was a poor fund, and many people were giving to the fund. When there was an issue involved, then we looked at what well, many, many people were called in to be a voice in this because there were many that were giving. It makes sense. If we look at it like this, that was the arose the rep representative form of the ch of church government came out of this situation mm -hmm. that we're representatives. Right? We have people because a lot of people are involved. Here's a solution. Acts chapter six, verse two. I'm moving quickly. Just have three minutes or so left. So it says, then the twelve called the multitude of disciples. So I see two different groups, don't you? Mm -hmm. The twelve is one group, right? And then you call the multitude in. Notice of disciples, and they said to them, it is not reason that we should leave the Word of God and serve tables. I kind of like this in here because I feel like sometime I'm doing some things that I need to put on the side over here and, yeah. and get to the Word of God and stay in the Word of God like we should do here. Moffat translation, one of it says here, uh, we don't need to be attending to, to passing out the meals. It's kind of interesting. And Godspeed says this, we don't have time to be keeping account. I thought that was interesting. The Bible of uh, basic English says this, to make distributions of food. Already the Jewish church had three men set up and they were taking care of the needy and those who had special needs. Church was too big. Three couldn't handle it anymore. And so what happened? The, the, the apostles said, you know what we need to do? Everybody's involved. Let's just call a big meeting here. Let's settle this issue because if we don't, there's going to be more issues that would come. So they said, what we're going to do is occupy ourselves in doctrinal issues. Isn't that right? Mm -hmm. In other words, you know, pastors and teachers and all, we need to occupy ourselves on those things that God has asked us to do and not get sidetracked on other things, even though they're good within themselves. There's a lot of people to help do that. The, the deacons or the seven, or they, were, they did the communal meal. They did the Lord's, uh, Lord's Supper, uh, the prayer time. Uh, I like it here because the early church I mentioned did more. I mean, they did a lot more here. And, uh, but these deacons had to be what? Quickly qualified. Mm -hmm. They had to be men of God. They had to be, uh, their morals had to be right. They had a spiritual condition. They had to be filled with the, the Holy Spirit it talks about here, the gifts of the Spirit, the gifts of God here. And then they were chosen. Hands were laid on them. Isn't that beautiful? Hands laid on, prayed for, they were set aside to do the work that needed to be done. So I thought it was very, very interesting here. So deacons then did what? They did a whole lot more. In fact, they were, they were recognized of, of, uh, as men who actually was leading out in the church to begin with. That's kind of interesting. That's pretty heavy responsibility, but it's a good responsibility. Mm -hmm. And I think maybe, this is my own little personal view, if you don't mind, I'll just say, you know, I just, I think maybe they need a little more responsibility today, you know, meet it out to them because I think with responsibility, when the Lord is calling to do it, it helps us to grow. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what is, the, what is the thought on here we're talking about here? I, I thought it was very interesting. I jotted down the Acts of the Apostle. I'll just read that to you quickly here, last few seconds, 88. Here's our issue. Here's what we did on it first, just to get it all set up here. Satan has succeeded in arousing suspicion. Prompt measures must now be taken to remove all occasion for dissatisfaction. Hmm. At least that lest the enemy would triumph in the effort to bring about a division among the believers. So really in the church, if there's you know, issues that come, we need to call the right group together, we need to talk about it, pray about it, get it worked out as fast as you can, the love of Jesus, because if you don't, it'll only fester up, get worse. And praise God, this church knew exactly what to do. 
And so mm -hmm. this leads right into Sunday, right? Monday's lesson, right? Yes, We're going to be talking does. about something very special, Stephen's ministry. Yes, so what they did, uh, the church then, they bring in men who are full of the Holy Spirit, yes. full of power, and they choose seven, and Stephen was among the seven of the first deacons. So what we see here is that the gospel is continuing to spread. Believers are being asked every day. You will recall, uh, are added every day to the church, and you'll recall that they were selling everything, they were sharing everything in common. And as you said, when you have rapid growth, mm -hmm. It's going to bring up opposition. It's just interesting that when you look at the history of the church, everything that could prevent the church from being established or overthrow it once it was established, everything was brought to bear, but God turned the attacks against the people. He turned their weapons against themselves. So we'll begin with Acts 6 and verse 8. It says, Stephen, full of faith and power, mm -hmm. did great wonders and signs among the people. So he's a man of noble character. Mm -hmm. He's full of the Holy Spirit. He's full of God's grace. He is full of the power of the Holy mm -hmm. Spirit. And as you said, he was doing more than just distributing the food to the widows. He was doing great miracles, great signs and wonders. And Stephen was the first of the New Testament dis disciples. Other than Jesus and the apostles, he was the first to do these miracles. So verse 9, Acts 6, 9, then there arose some from what is called the synagogue of the freedmen, Cyrenians, Alexandrians, and those from Cilicia and Asia, disputing with Stephen. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. So these are the Hellenistic Jews of the dispersion. We've got people who have been living in the area of the, uh, where they spoke Greece. This is how the Septuagint, uh, why they even created the Septuagint or translated in, into Greek. And what happened is these people have come in, and as you said, they've not been around the temples for a while. I mean, they came in for major feasts and things, but they had just a little bit of a different attitude. But so Stephen was a Hellenistic Jew, and he was mm -hmm. preaching at the synagogues of the Hellenists. Probably here, Acts 6, uh, 9 is referring to two of them, one of the southern immigrants, the Jews of Serene and Alexandria, and one of the northern mm -hmm immigrants for Cilician Asia. So he's a first class debater. He is arguing with the Spirit's power. And they were being out argued, if you could say. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, they just philosophically, they could not argue against the truth of God's word. But here's something that is interesting to me. As you read through, you see that many of the Judean Jews, those who had always lived in their homeland, those who had always been near the temple, they were much slower to recognize that the old covenant had passed, that Jesus had fulfilled all of the temple services, all of the signs, all of that. They just didn't recognize it as quickly. The Hellenistic Jews, perhaps because they were distant, did recognize it a little sooner. Mm -hmm. sooner. So here is Stephen preaching Christ of the new covenant who fulfilled the Mosaic law. He is preaching that the sacrificial system had come to an end and he meets opposition. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Jews, they feel like he is disparaging the importance of the temple. Mm -hmm. But what happened is that when they couldn't, you know, uh, when they couldn't, what can I say? When they couldn't argue against the truth, what did they do? Accused they up the ante, mm -hmm. didn't they? Mm -hmm. And now they are accusing him unjustly. They're slandering him. Verse 11, then they secretly induced men to say, mm -hmm. we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. They introduced false witnesses. This was a common practice among the Jews. They would actually bribe people to come forward 
and give false testimony. So they've got somebody that's coming forward saying that he is accused, they're accusing him of attacking the temple, attacking Moses. This is heresy and sedition, but then they really get down to it where they're attacking him and falsely accusing him of blaspheming not only Moses, but God. So verse 12 said, and by the way, what was the punishment for blasphemy? Death, Death by stoning. Death by stoning, yeah. right? So verse 12 says, they stirred up the people, the elders mm -hmm. and the scribes, and they came upon him, they seized him and brought him to the council. Do you realize they are inciting the very people among whom Stephen had performed all these signs and wonders. Who does that remind you of? It, you know, with Jesus, when he performed the signs and wonders, they didn't accept it as being from God. So you've got the elders who are the Sadducees for the most part, and the scribes, the teachers of the law who are the Pharisees. Mm -hmm. They needed little encouragement. They really already were incensed against mm. the apostles. They showed great animosity toward the Christians. So the persecution of Stephen begins and they drag him before the trial. This is the third trial of Christians because uh, before, when Stephen went before the Sanhedrin, Peter and John had already been there. Acts 6.13, they also set up false witnesses who said, this man does not seek cease to speak blasphemous words against this holy place in the law. For we have heard him say that Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs which Moses delivered to us. So undoubtedly Stephen had quoted what Jesus had said about destroy this temple and I'll raise it up again in three days. But what does the scripture say? Jesus wasn't referring to the temple of stones. He was referring to yeah, his, his body. body. And he did give a parable. Remember in the wedding feast, he gave the parable, a prophecy about the destruction of the temple. Mm -hmm. But he was promising he wouldn't destroy it. It was that the, he, God was going to send in the Roman armies to destroy it. Now, that was Matthew, uh, if you want to look that up, that's Matthew 22, verse 7. Acts 6, 15. This is the part I really want to get to. <laughs> All who sat in the council, mm. looking steadfastly at him, mm. saw that his face shone as the face of an angel. So they're looking intently. They're making eye contact. These are the high priests and the council members. And what do they see? He is quiet. He is composed. He, he has confidence and courage. He's not filled with fear and anger. But more than that, the face of an angel Mercy. probably startled the council. Mm -hmm. This was the same thing that happened when Moses came down off the mountain and his face was shining. Mm -hmm. The face of an angel Stephen's face was illuminated mm -hmm. with the glory of God. And you know, it's interesting because we're going to see Stephen's ministry was a link between the establishment of the church in Jerusalem and the conversion of the apostle Paul, who at the time was Saul of Tarsus. He was probably sitting in this council or was sitting in this council before whom Stephen was drug. And He's most likely the one who reported all of this to Luke. And then Luke, uh, as the historian, wrote it down. The extraordinary phenomenon of Stephen having the face of an angel never left Paul's mind. He never forgot it because his face was aglow with the love of Jesus Christ. And this toward his persecutors, just like Christ was. Stephen's speech that follows, we're going to get into that now, proves he was not guilty of blasphemy, but he was declaring that God is bigger than the temple mm -hmm. that, uh, and that all the articles of the temple pointed to Jesus. But as with Jesus, Stephen's getting the Jesus treatment, is he not? Mm -hmm. And true. as with Jesus, the council hearing precedes a violent end before the ultimate victory. Mm -hmm. Well done, well done. Amen. I think oft times, and we are moving to Tuesday now, um, what goes on in your head determines what your eyes see. Amen. Mm. Boy, that's true. Um, since 
many of these Jewish leaders were not ready to accept Christ. The default setting on blindness was accusing anyone who lifts up Christ of blasphemy. There's no way to get, to get away from that. We're talking about the nascent church in the first several decades of its existence. The city of Jerusalem and the temple were destroyed in 70 AD. Mm -hmm. And so we are well within the time when the temple is still there and the city is still intact. And I think that this touches on what you said, Shelley, that the fact that they were so slow to recognize because they had the building still there. Yes. The building was there. And so in their mindsets, really as long as we've got this building, mm -hmm. everything is okay. You know, the building is there. And I think one of the reasons the Lord allowed Jerusalem to be destroyed mm -hmm. was to take away this symbol, which was really impeding the progress of the early church. Mm -hmm. Plus the disciples, and I use this, this sort of common terminology, were spending a little too much time hanging around Jerusalem when they should have been moving out Right. doing the work of the Lord. Now, Paul realized he was an apostle to the Gentiles. That's right. But there was still a lot of focus mm -hmm. on Jerusalem mm -hmm. and what was happening in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. And it was time now for the church to begin to move out into the wider world. Uh, that's one of the reasons why you're getting some of this friction between the Hellenistic Jews mm -hmm. and the indigenous Jews because other people are beginning to come in. And their practice of religion is not precisely the same as it is in Jerusalem, but those needs need to be accommodated also. So you, it's not friction as much as it is the growth pains of any new organization that needs to get itself established. So that's what we, we are, are looking at. Um, Stephen was accused, arrested, and hauled before the Sanhedrin. As, as has well been said, for blasphemy. The notion, the idea that the Mosaic ceremonies and the law and the, the efficacy of what is being done in the temple could be nullified mm -hmm. was heresy of the highest order to, to the Jewish leaders. That's, that we, that's anathema. That just could mm -hmm. not be. Uh, again, because we got this building. We got this building. This building is here, so all must be right. The idea that you have to, work, to do works of goodness is deeply rooted in, in, in Judaism. I've got uh, a lot of good Jewish friends, even in New York to this day. My eye doctor, uh, my general practitioner was Jewish. Um, my eye surgeon was Jewish. You know, <laughs> my, uh, uh, Dr. Michael Lieberman, my, my good friend, his father was a rabbi. He was a, 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 a leader in New Jerusalem. We used to have some great discussions while we were, uh, while he's dilating my eyes, you know, but I can't see, so we just talk. Uh, back in the late 70s and 80s, there was a rabbi, a grand rebbe called Menachem Schneerson uh, in New York, who some thought actually was the Messiah. Um, but um, he would tell, he would get on the radio and tell the Jewish community, you need to attend the synagogue, you need to study the law and you need to do works of righteousness. So that was, that's, that's ingrained in Judaism. So the idea that, that we just have to rely on a carpenter, <laughs> you know, um, who we all know, we know his family, they didn't come from any great lineage. We got to rely on a carpenter. And we're used to kind of working our stuff out by ourselves. It, it just, as far as mindset is concerned, it was totally alien to what they're, they're doing. And then to be accused mm. of displeasing God because we got rid of this carpenter, mm. you know, it just makes no sense to us. And so Stephen now, full of Holy Spirit, and this is what is so exciting. These, can I say these guys yeah. were full of the power of the Lord. Amen. Full of, we see it again in Stephen. Um, these, they're not to be denied. You know, you put them in prison, you get them out of prison, where are they? Right back in the temple preaching again, you know. Uh, uh, didn't we tell you not to preach in this name? Well, it's better to obey God rather than man, Acts, right. than man, Acts 5, 29. So we have Stephen now, full of the spirit, as you well said, Shelley. And, and, and we're at the end, I need to just tuck this in here. We're at the end of the, the 490 year prophecy. We're at, we're beyond the, the yes. seven weeks and the 60 and two weeks. We're in that last week. In the midst of the week, of course, Messiah was cut off, right. not for himself. We're going to, uh, you know, Daniel 9, uh, 27. And now we're at the end of the week. Mm -hmm. um, 
and, and Israel is just about to close yeah. its fate. That's right. As far as that uh, 490 years is, is, is concerned. So now Stephen comes along and he gives this lengthy response, which takes up most of the chapter mm -hmm. uh, seven. Uh, and we come into this world which I haven't heard since the seminary, and that's covenant lawsuit. And I remember Dr. Daniel Augsburg telling us about the covenant lawsuit. It's a wonderful device that was employed by Old Testament prophets when they were, can I say this, Molly, taking uh, the people out to the woodshed? <laughs> See, that's, 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 not, that's, not a New, that's not a New York kind of a thing, but when it was time to get down to business and tell the people their sins, they used this methodology, this covenant lawsuit. Mm -hmm. What they did was they established the mighty acts of God. They went back and rehearsed, this is what God has done for you. And the Lord did this too. I am the Lord God before he gave the Ten Commandments who brought thee out of the house of Egypt, okay. out of the house of bondage. You know, I've done all this for you. Mm -hmm. Now it's your turn to respond appropriately mm -hmm. to what uh, I've done for you. Mm -hmm. So the second part of the covenant lawsuit is the idea that given what God has done, mm -hmm. this is your reasonable service, if I can say that. This yes. is your logical response to the goodness of the Lord. Um, uh, then that is followed by what you should have done, but did not do. <laughs> and then comes the sanctions. Now comes the spanking, you know. Uh, and so Stephen had to go through all of that. His arguments were irrefutable, Shelley. Absolutely. And, and, and when you have logic buttressed by the power of the Spirit of God, you can't gainsay that. There's nothing you can do but say hallelujah, amen. Mm. You know, <laughs> but they weren't in the mindset for hallelujah, amen. They didn't want to hear hallelujah, amen. And they didn't want to be accused of taking the life of this carpenter who they didn't accept as the new way, truth, and the life anyway. So now... Stephen uh, uh, has got to be dealt with. And I'm, I'm, I'm kind of leaving Reeb for you a little bit, Jill. Oh, no, but I wanna... you're good. <laughs> <laughs> because it's, it's, Reeb is the word for covenant lawsuit. It's a, it's a little, it's R-I-B, but the I has a little hat on the top of it. That changes the I to an E, so it's pronounced Reeb. But it is, a, it is a methodology used over and over again by the prophets in the Old Testament. And it is interesting that Stephen chose to use this methodology. It's long, it takes a lot of time, but it's necessary when you're in court to let the people know this is what God has done for you. And, and you know, um, Ellen White says this uh, to preachers. He says, every now and again, Shelley, you got to take them and hold them over the flames. Talking yeah. about the members. You don't do it every Sabbath. <laughs> you know, it's not, it's not something everybody, every now and you got to kind of hold them over the flames and let them feel the heat. And that's what Stephen was doing. He was kind of holding them over the flames and letting them feel the heat. So they had to understand that, um, uh, uh, God has done this for you. This should have been your response. You didn't give that response and now some things are going to have to happen yeah. uh, because God has got to make some course corrections. Uh, uh, and um, uh, they were not ready to hear that. They were not ready to accept that. They did not want that for their lives. And of course, so now decisions are being made. Isn't it interesting whenever the devil comes in, he's a liar and a murderer. Yes. Uh, when Christ heals, uh, rather raises Lazarus from the dead, you cannot gainsay because he was dead and now he's up walking around. So now we got to kill Christ. You know, that's the mindset. Yeah. So yeah. Um, now we're being accused of, of destroying Christ. We got to silence this guy. Yeah. You know, that, that's demonic. Mm -hmm. That's yes, coming from the enemy. Yes. Right. This the idea that if I, if I can't control you, I got to just kill you. Right. So we know that they are motivated by a demonic spirit yes. that was not of the Lord and yet we know that God was with Stephen in an unusually powerful way yeah. right up until the time that he passed. He was steadfast Amen. for the Lord. And in that is an example to all of us that we need to be steadfast Amen. for the Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor C.A. Mm -hmm. um, I just love to sit under the teaching of each one of the people here, but especially Pastor C.A. I always think I want to go to school and have him be my professor. <laughs>
<laughs> what a blessing. What a clear explanation um, of Stephen's, we sometimes call it Stephen's defense, but really it was a prosecution. He was on the offense. He was on the offense mm -hmm. against the Jewish leadership because as each one of you mentioned, he was called here before the great council, they call it, which would be the great Sanhedrin mm -hmm. there at Jerusalem. Those 71 members, this would be the leadership. Um, I know Molly at a previous uh, lesson, you talked about it being like the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. So Stephen's there, um, you would think defending the Christian faith, but really he is on the offense. He and on the he's offense. giving that reeb, that um, covenant lawsuit, what the people have done, what God has done, and what the people have not done in response to that. Um, there's an abrupt shift, and then my passage begins in um, Acts 7, verse 52. But there's an abrupt shift. I just want to point this out in how Stephen's presenting. The whole way through, he says, our fathers. And he identifies himself with the, with the Israelites, with the Israel people. And the whole way through, he says that. And then there's an abrupt shift that takes place at verse 51, Ms. Mm -hmm. Molly. Um, the, I want to read one quote here from Acts of the Apostles, page 100. It says, when Stephen reached this point, this is just before verse 51. There was a tumult among the people. Mm -hmm. When he connected Christ with the prophecies and spoke as he did of the temple, the priest, pretending to be horror-stricken, rent his robe. Yeah. To Stephen, this act was a signal that his voice would soon be silenced forever. He saw the resistance that met his words and knew that he was giving his last testimony. Mm -hmm. Although in the midst of his sermon, he abruptly concluded it. And you see that as you see, as he goes through, he really takes his time and sets this whole thing up. And then abruptly in verse 51, he shifts from our fathers to you, mm -hmm. stiff necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears. Come on. You always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers do. So do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who foretold the coming of the just one, that's the Messiah, Jesus Christ, of whom you now have become the betrayers and murderers. So at this point, the, the group is incensed. And we see that in verse 54. When they heard these things, now this is the Supreme Court. These would be like, we would think, the judges, the rulers of the land. And yet they were cut to the heart and they gnashed at him with their teeth. Mm -hmm. Now cut to the heart in the Greek literally means to saw straight through, to mm -hmm. saw asunder. Mm -hmm. It's used only twice in the New Testament. The other time it's used is in Acts 5.33 when Peter's on trial. And he says, remember, you ought to obey God rather than men. And it says there, they were furious. So whether they're furious or cut to the heart, either way, the same effect takes place. One staggering blow did not do the work. The truth laden with rebukes, mm -hmm. the entire sermon that um, Stephen gave was gradually making its way into their hearts. The personal application when he turned and said, you, that completed the work. So they gnashed at him with their teeth. In other words, they were extremely mad. Now, sometimes we get mad when someone cuts us off in traffic. That's a minor irritation. Or when someone maybe says something against you, Shelley, that's a minor issue. Maybe a moral issue or when you see someone being hurt, maybe more <laughs> indignation rises up within us. If we talk about race mm. or politics, you get, can get a little more upset. But in this case, the fury, the gnashing of the teeth, the shower of stones that is to come upon Stephen are only met with when that which is to be put down is the pure truth of God. Mm -hmm. The carnal mind is enmity against God. And that's what we see taking place here. So let's look at his response. They're mad and they're gnashing their teeth. And then verse 55, he, Stephen, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven. Several, each one of you mentioned about him being full of the Holy Spirit. The word in Greek for full is play race, meaning completely occupied with, completely filled up with. Mm -hmm. Shelley, you talked about his face shining as the face of an angel. He was completely full of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. He gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, look, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Now this is pivotal to me in two points. One, 
To me, it's beautiful, the encouragement that the Lord Jesus gave to him right at that moment. Mm -hmm. He looked up and he saw Jesus. We all don't see the heavenly vision, but we all can see that by faith. It reminds yes. me of the vision in Isaiah 6. Um, when Isaiah was called and he saw the vision of the temple, we know John the Revelator saw the vision of the temple. In Revelation 4 and 5, he was given that vision into the temple. So in a sense, just before Stephen's death, he's given this vision into the temple. And that's an encouragement. But at the same time, mm -hmm. by Stephen saying, Jesus is not seated at the right hand of the Father, what did he say? Standing. He is standing up. I believe that the Israelites, the children of Israel, they were students of the Old Testament, students of the prophecies, and they knew what that meant that the judgment of God was about ready to take place. Mm -hmm. God himself would judge the false teachers and leaders in Israel. You notice the call to repentance is missing from Stephen's sermon, as it were. Uh, Peter did it in Acts chapter 2, verse 38. He said, repent and let every one of you be baptized baptized. Acts 3.19, Peter's talking again, repent therefore and be converted that your sins be blotted out. Acts 5.31, Peter and the disciples again, him God has exalted to his right hand to be prince and savior, to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. But that repentance, as it were, is missing here because the people of Israel, the nation as a whole, had, as it were, filled up their cup. Mm -hmm. It reminds me of Daniel 12, 1. When Michael stands up at the end, what's happening? The judgment of the world is taking place. Psalm 68, we won't read it now, but Psalm 68 talks about arise, Lord, in judgment. This does not mean, I want to be clear on this, this does not mean that people who are Jews, people belonging to that religion cannot be saved. Of course it does not mean that. We're talking about the nation, the system as a whole. We know AD 34, you talked about this, Pastor C, the end of the 490 weeks and when that took place. Um, the Jewish leadership immediately, they got upset and they cried out with a loud voice. I'm in verse 57. They stopped their ears and they ran at him with one accord. They did not want to hear anymore and they ran at him. And they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. And we will see a great deal more of Saul mm -hmm. turned Paul in the book of Acts. And the Jewish leadership participated in the stoning. And then what is Stephen's response? Mm -hmm. And they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Mm -hmm. And then he said, he knelt down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he said this, he fell asleep. Mercy. Stephen's forgiveness just blows my mind away. At the very moment when the people who are mad at him, the people he was trying to bring Jesus to, they're stoning him and he's saying, Lord Jesus, do not lay this sin to their charge. Mm. I have six takeaways very quick in my remaining time. Number one, being filled with the Holy Spirit does not always change your outcome, but it always changes the outcome of those around you. Saul was converted as a result, partially, of Stephen's testimony here and what he witnessed in Stephen's life. Stephen still died, but the gospel was spread to the entire world in the persecution that arose after this. Mm -hmm. Number two, exercise faith even when you can't see. Stephen was given the privilege to actually see the heavenly sanctuary and Jesus. We all don't see that heavenly vision, but we can see it by faith. Hebrews 11, 27, Moses endured seeing him who is invisible. Number three, jealousy, anger, unforgiveness blind you from seeing or hearing yes. truth. The Jewish leaders stuck their hands in their ears mm -hmm. and they would not even listen because of their jealousy and anger and unforgiveness. Number four, self-deception is very real. Mm -hmm. I can walk forward believing it's the right way, picking up a stone as they were doing while hurting someone else and being directly and contrary to the word of God. So plead and ask God, search me, O God, and know my heart. Amen. Try me and know my thoughts. Number four, choose to extend forgiveness to other people, mm. whether it's asked for or not. And finally, trust God with the outcome. Come on. No Amen. matter Amen. what happens. Right. Amen. 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 Oh, that, yeah. th this is so encouraging 
to see this, this appointment of the seven. And Stephen, look how powerful he was, Amen. a deacon in the church. Mm -hmm. Even, you know, Stephen was the, the first one, and I think somebody mentioned this, the first one in the Bible to be martyred mm -hmm. was Stephen. And he was a deacon. He wasn't even one of the leaders, the big leaders in the church. That was Stephen. Well, what was the original commission, Acts 1-8, what was the commission that these were given, that the early church was given? Mm -hmm. But you shall receive power right. after that the Holy Spirit has come up on you and you shall be witnesses to me. You know, the reason you receive the infilling of the Holy Spirit is to be a witness. Be a witness. Yeah. And yeah. Jesus didn't want them. This, this, you know, the great commission is to go ye therefore into oh. all the world. Didn't want them just to stay in Jerusalem. Be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Well, now another one of these seven that were appointed was named Philip. Mm -hmm. And we're going to find some amazing things, the power of the Holy Spirit that is working in Philip. Now we've talked about the martyrdom of Stephen and how standing there, you read it, holding the coats of those that were doing the stoning was a, a gentleman named, did I use that word loosely, I think, <laughs> at this point, uh, the, and the, probably the leader of the persecution was Saul. Uh, let me read this to you about Saul in Acts uh, chapter 8, verse 3. And if you want to turn to Acts chapter 8, we're going to be in there for a few minutes. As for Saul, he made what? Have havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. Mm -hmm. But after his conversion, here is something that Paul admits. Now, this is Acts 26, verses 9 through 10. So I'll, I'll read that to you, Acts 26, verse 9 through 10. Indeed, I myself thought I must do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Mm -hmm. This I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priest. And when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. Mm -hmm. so, so we see Paul leading this thrust of persecution. And after the persecution or uh, in the stoning of the martyrdom of Stephen, the, the persecution of the Christians in Jerusalem really got hot. Mm. I mean, this seemed to be an impetus that just uh, ignited a fire to persecute the Christians. And this is what happened to a lot of the believers. It got so hot that they left town. Mm -hmm. It was too hot for them. Well, you know, there is good to that. That's right. Because what was it doing? I'm, I'm thinking, and this is in another lesson, but we talk about the great dispersion, dis dispersio, I think we call it. Uh, that's at another time and another place, but there are some elements of it here mm -hmm. because persecution caused them to, to go out into other areas. And what, where were they supposed to go? Jerusalem, Ju uh, uh, Ju uh, Judea, Judea Samaria. Samaria, and the uttermost parts, parts of the world. So Acts 1, 8, verse 1. At that time, a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the region of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Now, the apostles stayed in Jerusalem to take care of this early church, this baby church in its infancy. Acts, let's look at verse 4 through 8. Therefore, those were scattered, went everywhere doing what? Preaching. 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 So these that were scattered that the persecution in Jerusalem got so bad that they left <laughs> Jerusalem, but they didn't go just with their tail tucked between their legs. Mm -hmm. They went preaching the word yeah. everywhere. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. And the multitudes with one accord heeded the things of Philip hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. So Philip was full of the Holy Spirit and he was powerful mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. And it says that the multitudes heeded for unclean spirits crying with a loud voice came out of many who were possessed and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. And there was great joy in that city. Now this is in Samaria. Sam the Samaritans were half Israelites. They were monotheist. That means they believed in what? One, one, one God. God. Mm -hmm. 
even from the religious standpoint. They accepted the first five books of Moses, which is the Pentateuch. They practiced circumcision and expected the Messiah. They were looking for Jesus, mm -hmm. this city of Samaria. To the Jews, however, Samaritan religion was corrupted, mm. which means the Samaritans had no share whatsoever in the covenant mercies of Israel. The conversion of the Samaritans, because news of this great, uh, with Philip in Samaria, you know, that got back to Jerusalem. So the conversion of the Samaritans astounded the church in Jerusalem. Why? because they thought it was a corrupt religion. They had no faith, no confidence in the Samaritans, but what? There's a great move of God in Samaria, mm -hmm. a great conversion. Uh, so the apostles made a decision. We're gonna send out the big guns down to Samaria. <laughs> They sent out Peter and John to Samaria. And the reason they went there was to check it out, to assess the situation. So here's what they found, and that's Acts chapter 8, verses 14 through 17. Let's read that. Now, when Peter and John, the apostles, who were at Jerusalem, heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them. Verse 15, who, when they had come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For as yet he had not fallen upon them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid hands on them and mm. something happened. Mm. They received the Holy The Spirit. same experience mm -hmm. that the 120 had, Brother Kenny, yeah. in the upper room, that same experience was huh. loosed where? Right in Samaria. Mm. And they received the Holy Spirit. Now, here, here is what the thought is concerning that. God waited to send the Holy Spirit until Peter and John got to Samaria so that that was done mm -hmm. to convince the apostles that the Samaritans were to be accepted as full members well of said. the community well of said. faith. Well Absolutely said. Right. Mm -hmm. Absolutely right. You know what mm -hmm. that's including? Now, these were half Israelites, this says. It's bringing in the Gentiles. Mm -hmm. All right, all of you Gentiles, aren't we so glad? Amen. Oh, that God included us too. Okay. <laughs> and it, see, it didn't stop in Samaria. One more, and this, let me just tell you this story. Philip was just minding his own business. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Can I just tell it like this? Oh, yeah. The you. Spirit of the Lord overshadowed him and told him, I want you to go down to... Um, to, from Jerusalem to Gaza, that's in the, in the desert, because I want you to meet a man there. This man is a very powerfully influential man. He's head of the whole treasury in Ethiopia uh, for Cadence, the queen. Now, he is, he's a eunuch with great authority. Mm -hmm. And you know, Philip did exactly what the Holy Spirit told him yeah. to do. Mm -hmm. And what did he find when he, he came up to the chariot? He overheard the eunuch, the Ethiopian, reading out of what book? Isaiah. Out of Isaiah. And then Philip went up to him and he sa heard him reading. He said, do you understand what you're reading? Mm -hmm. And Philip and the, the Ethiopian said, how can I unless someone guides me? Now, what do you think Philip wanted to do in the first place? <laughs> so he started expounding on, it was the message of the Lord Jesus Christ. It says, so Philip preached Jesus Amen. and the eunuch accepted the truth and asked if he could be baptized. Right. Well, they were right by a body of water. Mm -hmm. And so Philip said, if you believe in your heart, yes. you may. Mm -hmm. And the Ethiopian said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God. Salvation is, oh, if I'm just going to stop here and tell you, salvation was never made hard. Salvation, if you believe in your heart and confess it with your mouth, Amen. you will be Amen. saved. Yeah. You can ask, Lord, what must I do to be saved? And I'd have to say to you, you're too late. He's already done it all. Mm -hmm. You just accept him Amen. and you'll be just like this Ethiopian. Well, the gospel was spreading. First, it went to Samaria yeah. and the Samaritan 
Samaritans were having an incredible revival. Then he went to an Ethiopian. You know what he did? He took the gospel all the way back to Ethiopia and started spreading the gospel. This small group of believers, let me just give you uh, something that, that the scripture tells us. This small group of believers did something. They turned the world upside down Amen. for the Lord Jesus Amen. Christ. Amen. And you and I are a product of it. Amen. 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 Oh, well done. Amen. Praise the Lord. I'm getting excited, right? Yeah. About all, that's what, that's what the, yeah, studying the book of Acts does for you. I jotted down like five things I thought was interesting on the lesson. Everybody brought out such wonderful points, you know, that maybe you hadn't quite thought of and just it brought it all together. Uh, number one, I jotted down that as, as the church began, success attended. Yes. Their efforts. Mm -hmm. The Holy Spirit was being poured out. Number two, that they had the tendencies to stay where the work was going on good. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, 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 it's one thing when the work's going good and then say, well, I'll go somewhere else and start somewhere. We want to kind of stay in the same spot because mm -hmm. it was going very good. They, then they forgot their commission was to go into all the world. Number four, because of the problem uh, in Jerusalem, said they had, they had to spend a lot of time shielding mm -hmm. these problems, trying to take care of these problems, mm -hmm. and they forgot, again, the commission, what they were supposed to do. Rather than educating other people to get the message out to the world, they had become satisfied with what had been accomplished. I think that can happen even nowadays. Good things happen maybe in the church, and sometimes we become satisfied with these things, and we don't want to go any farther than that. Number five, uh, what happened? God allowed persecution that we've been talking about here to come into the church, and then they were, they were scattered, and then they went about what God had told them to do to begin with, mm -hmm. not huddle all together, but go into all the world and okay. spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. So you can really see a story here really unfolding, and, and you know what? The lessons just get better and better and better, so you don't want to miss any of them. Quick closing thought. We have um, almost two minutes. Um, just a quick thing is that what you mentioned about the position of deacons, when they appointed deacons in the early church, there were no elders. So really they kind of filled the role of both yeah, deacon right. and elder. Mm -hmm. But the most important thing is that they chose men who were full Amen. of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. This is why Stephen could be like Christ. And mm -hmm. when Jesus said, you know, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they do. He was saying, don't lay this awesome. at their charge. Amazing. Amazing. Mm -hmm. yeah. The call was to leave Jerusalem and spread the gospel. That is the pattern for today. In Battle Creek, Ellen White said, don't pile up in Battle Creek, let's go. Uh, sometimes we tend to pile up in our churches. The yes. call is the same. Mm -hmm. yes. Come out and go and spread the gospel. Amen. That call is to everyone. Second Corinthians 13 says, we do nothing against the truth, but for the truth. And you know, I think uh, what took place with the life of Stephen, it was actually for the spreading of the gospel. Amen. And so I think we all ought to ask the Lord, just set me on fire, Lord, that I will be your witness here in this earth. Amen. Amen. Oh, beautiful thoughts, beautiful thoughts. And as we come to the closing, we're just very grateful and thankful again that you chose to be with us today. And I, we pray that this has been a real blessing. And I think it'd be nice and appropriate. We've got 20 seconds left just to have a little prayer. Brother C.A., would you just close it out with prayer, please? Gracious Father, we see and understand the, the power that came in response to Acts chapter 1, verse 8. And that power is still in the church today, yeah. Father. Help us to use that power, to avail ourselves of that power, to live lives that are dedicated to Christ, to let the light of Christ's love shine out in our hearts, that men and women may come and ask, what must I do to be saved? We thank you, Father, for your power and the presence of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.